Hey. <laughs> hey, Peter, how are you? Can you hear me? I can hear you, brother. Let me make sure. Peter, can you hear me? I hear you and see you. Peter Noel, the legend, the man, the legend. <laughs> Uh, don't say that too loud, man. How are, how are you, Peter? Thank you for joining us. I know we're a little bit late. I want to apologize to everyone. My son graduated tonight from middle school. It was supposed to be a Zoom graduation. And then suddenly New Jersey relaxed the laws about outdoor meetings. So they suddenly became a real graduation. Then on top of that, as Peter knows, and we'll talk about this in a moment, because um, because uh, I, I, I lost my father, I... Uh, I, I have to say the Kaddish every night, so I have to go find uh, the, the, the 10 person prayer quorum. Peter, let's begin with that. First of all, it's so good to see your face because uh, you and I are, we, we love each other. We're brothers. We're former radio co hosts. We have the most incredible history together. And um, you lost your mother from COVID 19 a month ago. And I lost my father, but not from COVID-19, thank God, but it might as well have been COVID-19 just 16 days ago. And you and I have always been like, you know, joined at the hip and for us to experience this tragedy at the same time. I, here I was calling you and comforting you just a month ago. And now we're in this uh, club that nobody wants to join. No, it's, it's not, it's not an easy thing, man. I, uh talking to a lot of victims. I mean, I hear the sirens every night and I hate hearing that siren because I know the next day somebody would be calling me to tell me, hey, my mother, my uncle, my brother, my sister had passed. And lo and behold, you know, we, my mother fought and when that call came, it was the most devastating thing. And I'm still dealing with it in, in, in some ways, you know, I'm dealing with it. So what are you going through, bro? Well, I know, I know you loved your mother very much and you used to talk about her all the time on our radio show. I want people just to know some of the history uh, and since my son, David Chaim, graduated tonight, he has to, uh, David, I'm doing this interview with Peter Noel. It's like an uncle to you, because you can please be quiet. Thank you. Peter, people don't know our history. Um, you and I were uh, every morning, 6 to 10 a.m., WWRL, 1600 a.m. here in New York City. We lit up the airwaves, man. We killed each other every single morning for New York's amusement. Now, I won every debate. I don't think you won even one. You won everything, bro. <laughs> <laughs> That's true. That's true. But uh, because this is a period right after your mother's passing, let me, uh, let me just say with all my heart that I discovered over that time that you are uh, a gentleman extraordinaire. You have a huge heart. We spent countless, uh, forget that every morning, 6 to 10 a.m., debating the issues of the day. And there were big issues like the invasion of Iraq, 2003. But besides that, we had a, a countless Friday night Shabbat dinners together. You and Louise got married in our home in New Jersey, which was one of the great honors uh, that Debbie and I have had. And it consecrated our home. It brought holiness to our home. And uh, while we may see aspects of the world from different perspectives, I have always had the deepest uh, love and respect for you uh as a as a man as a as a as a father as a husband as a son but above all else uh as a great champion of your people um so i can only imagine that the events of the past two weeks beginning with the murder of george floyd in minneapolis and uh and um, this this america reaching this moment of uh of awareness mass demonstrations against uh, police brutality uh, I can only imagine that this is something that you have been agitating for for a very long time, for America to kind of confront um, police brutality in, in general, or I should say specifically, and racism in, in general. And, and, and what I'm aiming for, and I want to make sure that I'm very inclusive for all the people here, is that I really want to get to the question of whether America really is still is predominantly a racist society or whether there are racial outrages that have to be that have to be protested against. And we're going to address that. And we may not agree, com agree completely, but I first and foremost want to salute you as a great African American activist, a great lover of your people. You have put you started um, you were one of the first voices uh, pointing out racial injustice, 
racial profiling, uh, police brutality outrages. You pioneered so much of this when you were a lone voice in the wilderness when no one else was doing it. And you paid a price professionally, and but you did it. And do you see this as a form of, vind of vindication for what you've been saying for decades? You know, actually, Shmuley, um, I got a call the other day from a, a Republican senator whose name shall I will not call. And um, he was saying, look, when I was fighting you um, back then, back in the, in, in the 80s and in the 90s, pretty much when I was at the Village Voice doing all these stories on police brutality, he was saying, why, why, why is there a need to do this? Why are you, that, that, you know, bringing, trying to bring races against each other? And I kept telling him, I said, no, these are things that are happening. This is America's dirty secret. I said, you guys right now are obsessed with AOC and not <laughs> AOS, which is the, uh, 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 the original sin, uh, America's original sin. Right, they, they go after AOC and say, oh, she's this, she's that. But a the AOS, America's original sin, is what we need to deal with. And I, and I kept telling him, I said, look, what I did back then was very, very important, not only to black people, but to African-Americans. And I recall today, I, I was reading an excerpt from my book to someone today who wanted to hear this, um, that uh, Reverend Sharpton, back in 1999, went into, into Borough Park, where Gideon Bush, who was a, 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 a Hasidic man. You know, he, well, he the, the cop says, hey, he came up with a hammer and he had to shoot him. And Shapton says, look, I'm going, killed. I remember that, yes. I'm going into Borough Park regardless of what the Hasidim says. The Kahanakai people said, we will kill you, Shapton, if you come there. But there were other Jews, you know, uh, who says, uh, like Andrew Stepner, Jews for Racial and Economic Justice, who says, we will ride with you, Reverend, into Borough Park. I mean, I was in the car with Reverend Shapton at the time. They wanted to kill us <laughs> because you know, Shapton says, injustice anywhere, you know, Martin Luther King quote, he, will, he wanted to get justice for Gideon Bush. He said, no, we will handle it ourselves. And this is the problem that I have, I've had with uh, my Jewish brothers and sisters over the years in terms of bringing everybody, to get, everybody together to fight this, this particular injustice, you know, and uh, we, we, we got out of there with our lives. But let me just say something. Today, African-Americans, Jews, Indians, Chinese, everybody, we have to get together and it's just doing it right now. So what I did back then, I am just happy and gracious uh, for the fact that people took it, people understand, the people are still quoting uh, from those stories and people are still bringing them up. Some whites who, who are against me, writing some of my colleagues at the paper, uh, at the Village Voice, they've come to me, they've all written to me and says, Peter, you were right. Peter, let me, let me be clear. Uh, no one is going to disagree that the murder of George Floyd was an American abomination. It was almost painful to watch. Um, the, the callous indifference on the part of a man in authority, a, a police officer, as he slowly watches a man lose consciousness, call out for his mother, and a big man, a big strong man. And then all the other uh, stories and the names that have now been uh, ingrained in the American psyche of African-American men and some women, but primarily African-American men who've been shot by the police, killed by the police. Um, or other stories like Eric Gardner with, uh, where they were asphyxiated. No one denies that this was, these were crimes. These police had to be prosecuted. These may indeed have been racist police. Maybe they were motivated specifically by racism. But my question to you is, do you really believe that this is indicative of America as a racist country, that racism is in America's DNA? Meaning, when you say America's original sin, I agree with you. I just wrote a column about this and I, and I sent it to you. No one denies that America was birthed amidst slavery. No one denies that this was gone for hundreds of years. No one denies that up until 150 years ago, it's hard to believe that in what should be, and the, the freest country in the world, up until 150 years ago, Black babies were ripped away from their mother's breasts and sold on the block at, like cattle. No one disputes that. And no one disputes that even after the Emancipation Proclamation, that, uh, that 100 years of Jim Crow segregation, African-American men and women being beaten with lead pipes to take a bus in the South and the Freedom Riders. Martin Luther King, the greatest American of the 20th century, felled by an assassin's bullet, a white racist, um, after he marched peacefully with sanitation workers on, uh, in uh, April of 1968. No one disputes all that. It's true 
Racism, unfortunately, seems so deeply embedded in the American psyche. But people like me want to believe, maybe, maybe we're delusional, but we want to believe that we've, that we've gone beyond much of that, that most cops are actually heroes and they're not racist. There are racist cops and they have to be prosecuted to the full extent of the law. But we want to believe that America is not racist. We want to believe that when Barack Obama defeated a white American war hero who, uh, whose father was the admiral commander of the Pacific Fleet in Vietnam, and his father was a, was a great admiral in the Second World War, and Obama won in a white majority country twice, and he might have even been elected a third time. Uh, that's how popular he was. We want to believe that America is not a racist country. It's a country that has racist outrages like George Floyd that has shaken America to its core because we, and, and I might even argue, it's shaken America to its core because we're not a racist society, meaning we can't believe that cops would do this and we're so sick and we want to vomit. Am I wrong? Am I fooling myself? Yeah, listen, America is a racist society. America is a racist country, uh, regardless of how you pass it. You can go back, you know, and, and all these things you have just enumerated, you know, it just makes the point of where we are in America. For 400 years, Shmuley, um, racism has gone through so many iterations in terms of the subtleties, how they want to, you know, come at us, the, the, the different ways. The, the reason we're calling what um, um, George uh, uh, Floyd went through, did, happened to George Floyd, a, 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 a newfangled lynching, because it's another iteration of how they get to us. It's a, it's a lynching. But it's a new, it's new fangle, you know? America has many ways it, it, it has done you know, to keep that legacy, that brutal legacy, that torturous legacy of racism. It's subtle in many ways, it's open, it's overt, it's covered. We are fighting it every day. You know, you walk outside, you know, and your sons, your daughters, and police officers, you know, have a target to uh, say, hey, that's my one. And, and for black people to live with that, for anybody to come up with an argument, to try to pass the language and say, hey, Maybe it's not. Maybe America is not as racist because we elected Barack Obama. No, white people pretty much vote against their interests in many respects. They saw something in Barack Obama that they had to, and they got together with the mood of the country at a particular time because of, of, of the incompetence of past administrations. So uh, if that, did not, that did not affect me in, in a big way that Barack Obama was the first black man to be you know, appointed president of the United States and somehow this is a post-racial American. No. It is still there. It, it, that, happens, that happens to us all the time. I don't care what people tell me. What I've seen today is that one young white folk, they are saying, we don't care what happened in the past. We know what's happening today now because we are living with this issue of racism. Because if uh, young people say, if I'm walking on the street with my black friend, a white police officer will stop me and ask me, are you okay? Are you, are you, are you a hostage? It's something that happened to me and you driving in a car. You know what I'm saying? So you know that. that when has we were, not gone yeah, when we, when we were coming back from a radio show, the funny thing is that, you know, we had, you and I had just a blast every morning, 6 to 10 a.m. The Peter and Shmuley show was, is, is a legend. It's like a New York legend. It has to be brought back. This, if, if there was ever a time that the country needs this kind of dialogue, it's now, which is why I'm so grateful to you, Peter, staying up late and talking to me now. But yes, we were. I was driving you back to the city, driving you to Harlem, and then uh, we discovered that a police officer is wondering whether you took me hostage. But but even, can... even though it's clear that you would be afraid of me, I mean, I am the one who looks ferocious. Okay. But I did uh, tell you. I did tell you. I said, Shmuley, you and I are driving in a car. You driving what? A Mercedes Benz or something like that? Or a, 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 what? What's the it was a, I think it was a white Lexus. Yeah. Yes, right. And I'm telling you, I said, Shmuley, we're going to be stopped. You, a Jewish man with a yarmulke, I'm, I'm with an Afro. They're going to stop us, and they're going to tell me that I am the one. I have done something to you, so I have kidnapped you. So I'm trying to tell you, this is what happens in America today. The subtleties are very overt now. When this man had his knee on on, on George Floyd's neck. He put his finger with, with his hand in his pocket. He's posing. Here I am, brother Trump. Here I am. I'm making America great again. I'm, this is what you want me to do. This is what you want me to. This is this is what is reflective of, of that, this this part of America that supports you. Here I am. This is what I'm doing. I'm doing this for you. That's what I saw that day, long before we found out that he is part of this whole MAGA system. You know, come on, this brotherhood. This you know you know. 
it's, it's not there. You know, we can't make any excuses for it. We can't pass the language. Anyway. No, but, but Peter, but Peter, but no one's making excuses. America, the the George. You, you want to see the book? No, you want to see? And I agree with you. I, I'm, I'm. What I'm wondering is, no, see, what I'm wondering is, by the way, this is my, this is my Afro, Peter. I just want to make sure that you know that. Okay, um, and it's turning more and more white. Um, let's take a step back for a moment. So I, I uh, went to many of the demonstrations in New York. You know, I was in mourning for my, my father. I, we went to, my, to Israel to bury my father. I come back and I see the, a city that I love and a city that's actually very diverse. A city that could have a show like the Peter and Shmuley show. Um, I see the city, you know, in convulsions, peaceful protests, very welcome, so important. And like I said, you predicted so much of this. You actually deserve a tremendous amount of credit for having predicted much of this and having put your professional career and reputation on the line when it wasn't in vogue, by the way. Um, but the violence, no, that was unacceptable, but I don't want to focus on that. I want to focus on something else. No, no, don't drop it, don't no, 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 wait, no, wait, let's, let's come back. To, let's come back. To, let's come back in one second. One second. Let's just come back in one second, Peter, because I want to bring up a different point. So I'm, I'm in Union Square and I'm filming this live on Facebook like I am now with our conversation. And there's about a thousand, I'm with my two sons, and there's about a thousand protesters who are marching very peacefully. And they then stop in Union Square, they get on a knee. And an African-American activist, very articulate, very handsome, very charismatic, he gets up and he says, I want all of you to be, uh, to be very peaceful. I want, I, want, I want to be clear, he said. We came here in peace. Look at the police. And there were like probably 50 police in front of him. And they were in riot gear. But Peter, about a third of the police were actually black and about half of those were African-American women, women. So he gets up and he says, the, if I, I don't wanna misquote him and it's on Facebook so people can watch it. But I think he said, we know the police can be murderers. We know that you're, you're murderers, the NYPD can be murderers. And, 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 and especially the minority police who are here, you should be ashamed that you're part of the police because the police are murderers. And I was thinking to myself, I'm watching these young African-American women wearing the NYPD uniform in riot gear. And they stood very stoically listening to him saying this. Now they weren't murderers. They were African-American women. This was their job. I think they're heroes. I think they risk their lives every day to keep New York safe. I think that they care about the public welfare. After 9-11, Peter, we said these people were the greatest heroes. So are we gonna say that all cops are racist? Of course not, right? You know, uh, yeah, the president of the United States says 99.9% .9 of them are good. I, I beg to differ with that kind of fuzzy math, fuzzy stats, stats. You know, I we don't. I, I, the most of the people I have encountered, you stop any black man out in the street today, and they will tell you, "Hey, I've been stopped by police," and, and not just white police officers, black police officers too are part of that culture. What that guy was saying to about uh, who they, they put the black woman on the front line, black police woman. Some of them, they, they, some of them are the most brutal. Some of them are the most. They're rude. They, they are insensitive to because they become part of the police culture. They don't, they, they, they see an African-American and they enforce that stereotype that, that has been enforced by, by their white counterparts so that they can be accepted. I'm not attacking you know, women police officers. I have to be saying that they've become part of the culture too. And again too, surely I know white cops who would die for me. I know black cops who would die for me too. You know, and, and because of that system, I know cops who really want to police African American communities. We want we want police officers in our communities to get out drug dealers, do different things. We don't want police officers rushing into our homes to do what they call so called extractions and just pull us out and say, "Hey, you know, he resisted. I, I thought he was reaching for a gun. Then he had nothing at all, and they kill him." No, we don't want that. But these police officers, pretty much, that they're putting on the front line now, these black police officers, they say, "What? What are we here for? What are we here to do? To do what? To rip heads? To show you that we can rip heads just as just as good as you? This is the whole system. When, when they talk about defunding the police department, it's talking about a fundamental change in the way we police African American males, not just males now, but the entire community." And they're going to put black cops at the forefront. They're going to bring them in from different areas and say, trust them into communities. You think that they're going to turn a blind eye to crime? That's not the issue. That's not what we are talking about. We are talking about sensitivities, talking about understanding the people who you police. And black women police officers are going to play a very important role in that. And uh, I'm looking at that. I'm seeing it. But you know, we have a, a larger discussion too. When this whole reformation that's taking place, this whole reconciliation thing that must take place before we can trust police officers again, it must happen. Something has to happen. And you will see more confrontations on the line before black police officers 
process too. Get the idea. We can be part of that culture. We have, they're somehow lost in that culture where police, white police officers are doing the killing. You don't hear black police officers pretty much killing other black suspects. It's their white counterparts and, they are, and they're in the same car. They're in the same car when the stops are made, when they stop them and push them unnecessarily and they say nothing, they turn a blind eye. So we have to talk and educate these black police officers they're trying to bring in at the forefront into our communities. You want things to go better? You need to change the culture. You're not, you're not supposed to, you can't be belong, you can't belong to that culture at all. We want to eradicate that. But there was a time, Peter, that amidst some of these police outrages, and there of course have been far, far too many, far, far too many, but there was a time that we saw the police as heroes. And it wasn't that long ago. After 9-11, after we thought they were heroes. We saw them running up buildings and dying to save blacks and whites and minorities. And, 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 and that wasn't that long ago. And I, I, I see the change. Look, defund the police. Who's going to suffer if we defund the police? Everyone. Here in New York, everyone's going to suffer. Minorities, I agree. Sorry? I agree with you. I agree with you on that. I'm, I'm, I'm not for, listen, this, this phrase, defund the police, <laughs> is going to take on its, a, a true meaning at some point. Right now, you know, we, we were supposed to define anarchy down because somebody threw out that, somebody who likes chaos. Well, oh, come on, you, don't, you can't have a community without police. We don't want that. I don't want that. So at some point, we're going to define that. People are learning how to define it. What does it mean? Does it mean that we're going to take away uh, funds from, from the police department, which is so militarized? That we don't, we're going to deny them that new truck that it looks like a, like, a, like a tank when you're coming to African-American communities. That's what it means for me to defund them. You know, I, I, so it's going to get different def definitions. It's going, to, it's going to go through its different iterations. But uh, that for me is not a big phrase. Right now, I think the GOP, the, 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 the right. You want, you, want to, you want to reform the police. You don't want to I defund want to them. them. Yes. I don't, I don't want to disband, this, this, this is the deal. You can disband a police station because it has been done in this country before. You can take out, throw the bombs, bring them back. If you want to reapply for your job then, let me see how much you need this. Let me see how much you respect the communities that you, you say you want to police. And that's what I want. That's what defund the police means to me. You know, you, we must have, we must have a, a police officers, we must have peace officers in our communities. I don't want to give the job to some uh, uh, some guy, some black community leader who has his own thugs and is enforcing it against others. No, it has happened before when these so-called community leaders say we can police our own community. It hasn't worked. Peter, you and I, um, by the way, I love our conversations and uh, we don't have enough of them public. Uh, uh, we have to do a lot more. And I, you know, you and I should be inspired after everything that has transpired to, because we were pioneers on the radio. We talked about issues like these when no one else was addressing it, when it certainly was not sexy to talk about this, when, there, when no national emergency or, or no need for national reconciliation was, was, was seen. I, I see a need for national reconciliation. Look, um, I, I don't have, uh, as a Jew, I don't have white guilt. I don't, I, I, because the Jewish people have faced, um, unspeakable persecution, but, and annihilation in the Holocaust. And there's still a lot of anti-Semitism in the United States, of course, especially of late, we've seen Jews murdered, shot, killed in their synagogues. But, but what I of course recognize is that while the Jewish experience around the world has been horrible, especially in Europe and for 2000 years, that, thank God, has not been the case largely here in the United States, where racism, American racism, has been directed specifically at African Americans, at Blacks. Jews were not brought here in chains as slaves, thank God. Jews were not told they had to go to the back of the, of the bus. Jews, um, thank God, are not, well, you gave the, the example of Gideon Bush, but um, we're not seeing Jews being shot by police, thank God. <laughs> we shouldn't see anyone shot by the police, but we are seeing Jews shot by white, race, by white supremacists, racists, uh, neo-Nazis, et cetera. And, and, and you and I share a belief that, that blacks and Jews are brothers and not just because of a shared history of persecution, but a, a, shared, uh, a, a shared spiritual promise. And much of this crystallizes in the, in, in the personality of Martin Luther King greatest American of the 20th century who brings the Hebrew Bible to life as a liberation manifesto, 
as Zechariah, Isaiah, Jeremiah. I know your mother was very religious, uh, your late mother of blessed memory who just passed away. But he takes the Hebrew Bible, makes it a liberation manifesto, and, uh, and transforms America. But Peter, remember that Martin Luther King went to march with sanitation workers in April of, uh, first in March of 1968, and he was very disappointed in the first march because there was violence. And, and he was almost embarrassed because he was profoundly nonviolent. So then he insists that there be a second march because he wanted to have a nonviolent march. So he goes back and he marches on the 3rd of April, 1968. And then he's murdered the next day on, on the 4th of April while he's awaiting uh, an in a court injunction stopping the march. That's how much he was opposed to violence. No matter what the excuse could be, he was opposed to violence. Now, so I need you to give me your comment on that because I know that you have a slightly different take. What is yeah. it? Okay. King was, the, King was the biggest radical of war. They tried to box Dr. King into that corner, as you know, to talk about, but, well, Dr. King, you are nonviolent. What about all this violence going on around you? He says, and he, he, said, he used the term, he defined rioting as an expression of, of, of the people, an expression of the rage within, you know, that, 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 that comes forth. And, and um, um, rioting pretty much is, it's, it's a rage. It's, it's, you know, at some point when um, pressure builds up, the rage must come out. It's, it's flooding the hearts and minds of people all over the place. And, and Dr. King never said, right, I'll condemn violence, I'll condemn, you know, you know kill, they're killing you, and I for an eye and two for two. He said, I will condemn that. But at some point, we are, do you understand that the fact that uh, the police officers have their feet on the necks of, of African-Americans who are trying to live, who are trying to breathe, and you don't want them to respond? King was totally, he, he went away from that idea that we cannot respond. He, he, when they tried to define what civil disobedience is for him, he said, look, this could mean anything. Malcolm X says, we have to fight by any means necessary to remove this oppressor's need for more for our necks. So that's what it means. And I, I you know, King, King yes, I, when people bring up King to say, hey, what you guys doing, Dr. King would not, not like that today. Dr. King would give us some medals. Dr. King would be on the front line. I'm not saying Dr. King will go and snatch a, a, a 78 television from, from, um, from Best Buy. You know, I don't think he would loot Macy's, but you know something, the way they define this, this is black economic appropriation uh, as reparations for the stolen lives. That's how some people see it. There are other people now who are wanton, there are other people, there are, there are right radical groups, radical groups who have invaded this nonviolent movement, this peaceful movement, and this created type of him, mayhem because they want to have their own agendas. But black people out there are not burning down their own uh, communities. They're not doing that because you know um, they, they want to be violent. There are other people who have come into the mix, outsiders. I agree with the whole talk that they're outsiders. And then there are people within the community too, who we have stopped, who we have told this is not the way that we want. We want to address those grievances in a peaceful way. But at the same time, too, if they are attacked by police officers, they have to defend themselves. And I see a lot of people, white, blacks, uh, Indian, Chinese, everybody's going to jail because what, what the cops have done. Imagine you are at a rally to fight against police brutality, and police brutality happens right in front of your eyes, on television. Cops don't care. But Peter, I actually don't believe that you fully believe that. And I'll tell you why. I don't because, believe that. Uh, no, I'll tell you why. I, I, don't, I don't think that you actually believe in any justification for, for violence. And I'll tell you why. I'll, I'll, take, I'll, take, I'll take you. Oh, no, 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 but let me tell you. Let me, let me, let me make don't, the point. Don't use the words. Don't use the words. That's a defined no. I'll take, uh, no, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to prove it from your life. Look, I don't, I don't know many, many African-American activists who have, have been as articulate as you, as compelling as you, as consistent as you, for decades, you have fought this battle almost alone. You're the one who helped to bring the knowledge, even, even the, the notoriety of, uh, of Reverend Al Sharpton to the masses. You're the one who was writing cover stories about him in the Village Voice going back 30 years when he was uh, a, not a nationally known uh, preacher and activist. You helped to create uh, his fame. He, he, I think he even acknowledges that. Um, and he was on our radio show many times, uh, you know, the three of us together. You and I traveled with uh, Reverend Sharpton to Israel on a solidarity mission. You and I have a famous story there. I'll get to that as well. But, but Peter, almost no African-American activists have been as consistent as you, as vocal as you, as compelling as you, as persuasive as you. And yet 
you've never hurt a teddy bear. You've never hurt a fly. You, you wouldn't. It's not in you. You're a man of tremendous love. And that's what makes your words so... That's why I take you so seriously, because I know that you are... You're, 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 you have rage because you are very upset that America still doesn't get it. And you've been trying to wake people up through the written word, the spoken word, but you've never engaged in any kind of violence and you never would. It's not in you, it's not who you are. You're, you're a man of profound moral bearing, profound moral integrity, and that's what makes you compelling. That's what has made you impact on someone like me so deeply, so profoundly. You've changed a lot of me. And, but you've also made me respect you to the hilt. And a lot of people say to me, when you were, I were on the radio together, a lot of people said to me, you know, Shmuley, you're, you're, you're a, a pro-Israel activist. You're a Jewish activist. You fight anti-Semitism. And Peter is such an incredible critic of Israel. You know, how could you and he be friends? And my response to them always was, and I'll say it right now on the record, Peter Noel is one of the finest human beings I know. He's one of, he has a heart of gold and he is a friend for life. And we can disagree on things. That's the beauty. That's what America is supposed to be. So I'm using you as an example of someone who would never engage in any kind of violence because it's not what you really believe. It's not what you, and it, and it wouldn't be effective. You have been effective. You've been vindicated now because you have a moral uh, standing. You saved a Jewish life in Crown Heights during the 1991 uh, riots in Crown Heights. There was a Hasidic Jew who was a goner. And you stood between him and a mob who might have killed him, and you saved his life. You, you saved his life. Yeah. So, but what I'm saying to you, right? I'm not saying that I would personally, you know, go and uh, pick up something and show at the police. I, I, I'll tell you a story just now. But uh, I'm talking about what I see African Americans do, and how do you justify what they're doing? And if they pick up something and they pelt it back at the police, they pelt back a canister. Uh, of tear gas against the police. I consider that self-defense, you know, if, if that's the case. So they're going to be tear gas, they're going to be suffering, that they're going to be, these, the police officers are going to be using their, their, their modern day hoses, you know, to hose them down, to do different things, to beat them silly, beat them into unconsciousness, and they must not respond. You have to respond slowly. I'm not endorsing violence. I'm endorsing self-defense. When I, talk, when, I, when I spoke to you, uh, when, I, when I tell you things about this rage that goes with him, I made the ultimate statement about, about reaction, about retributive justice, right? Some say retributive justice, right? I made an ultimate statement about my son. When Giuliani says that he will be stopping any black man you know, and, 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 and to find out whether or not they fit a crime that police officers are investigating, I, and, and they were, um, Haitians were marching across the Brooklyn Bridge for because they, they had, some police officers had attacked a, 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 some Haitian um, immigrant. And I went to my editors and I said, listen to me, if anybody, you know, Patrick Dorsman they were marching for, uh, this guy who was unarmed, I went to him in tears. I said, look, if, if a police officer, white, black, green, yellow, whatever, unjustifiably takes my son's life, I'm not waiting for Giuliani to say, hey, this is what happened here, that you know, this is a mistake, this is an aberration. I, I, I put it on the front page of the Village Voice with my own son. I'm hugging, I'm hugging my son on the front page of the cover of the Village Voice. If a cop kills my son, I will kill the cop. But I explain, you know, that whole thing, my love for my son, the depth of grief I felt for my own, my own son at that point. I, as a father of my own son, if he was doing nothing wrong, what I would do to that police officer. That's the kind of rage I would feel. If, he, if, he, if you ask him for his wallet, and in your racist mind, it, it, it morphs into a gun, I'm, I'm, I'm taking you out. That's the kind of that's the kind of rage I have within me. And you know something? I didn't expect white folk in the village voice to actually put that on the cover. But they put it on the cover because I was able to explain my love and the rage and depth of grief that African American parents feel for their slain sons and daughters today. I was able to explain that rage. So the rage that I feel, Shmuley, so if if I, if I could go out there and a police officer should, should attack me for nothing, I'm not going to simply beat me. I'm not going out like George Floyd. As long as I'm not in handcuffs, I'm gonna fight back. That's me. No, self-defense is self-defense, Peter. No one's gonna dispute self-defense. Well, yeah, yeah, and, well, and if it's and if it's uh, well, and if it's a, well, a well, 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 cop, that, that folks are not attacking. That folks are not every day attacking police officers. They're not going out there on a daily basis attacking white police officers. They're not doing that. It's the other way around. 
no one disputes the fact that there are bad apple cops. The question is whether this is indicative, whether we can superimpose this on, on, on all cops. And I still want to believe, and I do believe, that the that police officers, that it's that they are honorable, that they're engaged in in, in, in public service. I, I, I recognize that when you see a callous murder like George Floyd, it shakes one to one's core. I, I it has shaken America to its core. Listen, Peter, you're a very important voice. Your voice has to be heard. Uh, there is a measure of, while you and I have, you know, still have areas of profound disagreement, this is a moment of vindication for you insofar as you, were, you pioneered, you pioneered speaking out on behalf or, or against police abuse, outrages, when everyone else said that this is not a big deal and it's aberration, uh, you were one of the first to ever discuss it, discuss it. And in fact, it would be fascinating for me to go back to uh, the recordings of our shows four hours a day because, because you were a prophetic voice on a lot of this. But you know what, Peter? I also think that you're a voice of reconciliation and healing. I think, I, I know that you are a champion of your people. That's why I respect you. If you weren't, there wouldn't be the same level of respect. I want you to be a champion of your people, but because you command the respect of the African-American community, because people look up to you, because people know that you put it all on the line, because people know how much you sacrificed and how much you risked and how much, and the price you paid, you could actually be a great voice of healing and reconciliation because you have phenomenal, almost unparalleled credibility in the African-American community because you were saying all this, this when there was no, there was nothing to gain. You only paid a price for it. So now I just feel we need some kind of reconciliation in America, Peter. You and I are now, you're mourning a mother, I'm mourning a father. America's mourning, America's mourning George Floyd. I think everyone with a heart who saw the callous murder of this innocent man and the callous indifference of the cop who just continued to fricking choke him to death is shocked to their core because we don't want to believe that things like this happens in such a great country like America. So the thing is this, right? As far as I get to you, uh, to sum up here, uh, we, not all cops are bad, right? So, I mean, that's, that's, what, that's what we're trying to say here, right? I, I, I want to believe that. I want to say, I said, not all cops, I believe, would want to actually, you know, kill me. But I believe all cops belong to a particular culture, right? And that culture is that the African American male is that permanent suspect. And we have a certain stereotype, we have a certain way that we need to police him. He is the broken African American male. You wrote a book about the broken male. I put African American in front of that. They think they, they believe they understand how this broken African American male can be fixed by this rough type of policing. That, so I am, I am very skeptical now of the reform. I want reform, but I, I've, I've always been skeptical about police officers. When you are in my skin, Smoley, when you get into this skin, you know, and you walk outside of the street, you are looking back. You can be, you become a victim. So the, so the skepticism that, that pervades me, that enshrouds me when police officers are around, it's not something that I would apologize for. It's not something that I would pass. No, 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 listen to me. I'm not saying that you're telling me I have to. You know, I mean, but they must, they must know that I have a certain fear of that police officer when, he, when I see him. And, and, and they must understand too, that at some point that fear will be challenged, you know, and, and the police officer, when he wants to do that encounter between him and I, it could go either way. That's, that's, that's how we live as black men today. Oh, Peter, that is a very fair point that people, that the white community does not understand the degree to which African-American men especially can be seen as immediate suspects that you are guilty before being proven innocent in just walking down the street. Listen, I mean, there have been discussions about it to be, to be fair, but on, to a much lesser extent. You know, when uh, was Danny Glover said that even as a famous Hollywood star, he, he, couldn't, get a, he couldn't get a taxi, remember? And then, and you, so, and that was happening when you and I were on the air. But, but of course, being shot is, is uh, infinitely more serious. 
I, I get that point. And, and that the white community is kind of waking up to that now. Listen, I mean, when I walk around with a yarmulke, it, 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 it gives a certain stereotype to me and how I'm seen by other people. It make, makes me identifiably Jewish immediately. Uh, does it make me uncomfortable at times? Sometimes, especially if I'm walking in places that are not necessarily safe for Jews. It might be in places in Israel. Um, it might be some places in the United States. I, I get it, not to the same extent. And I know that there has to be greater sensitivity on all of our parts. And this is a, this, what we've seen over the past two weeks has never really happened before, right? I mean, you haven't seen this happen before, never to the same extent, correct? Uh, as a no, national, no. I'm sorry? No, not to the extent that I've seen it. But so why, so, so, so as we were running out of time, so why, Peter, why was George Floyd different? I mean, this, unfortunately, yeah. This has happened before. Innocent black men have been have been shot, killed, murdered. Why this time? Why do you think it's 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 different? Because, because surely we have a generation of millennials. We have a generation of young white people who have gone to colleges who says, "I want to go to New York City to study at Columbia University. I want to go to different things, and I will have a black friend." You know, regardless of what my parents somewhere in the Midwest tells me, I will have that black friend. And, and I would talk to that black person. I would understand the experiences. I would say certain things that <laughs> my black person might tell me, hey, you can't say that because you, you live in a different place and you're in a different community now. I go to Columbia University. I have been at Columbia University for the last three years. I've been lecturing to some of these classes and some of these kids have no clue about what goes on on the other side. Harlem is right on the other side. They don't know, you know how black people live. And I'm simply saying that uh, the, Right here in Harlem, in, in, in bed in the same borough park, different places, you have young, young, young white people who have black kids, black sons and daughters now. So they do understand this whole thing about, you know, when they go out uh, and they, they're living in fear until they come back in. They, I see young kids, on, uh, uh, white, I mean, black kids on, on, the, on the backs on the shoulders of you know, strapping young white men, you know, who, and that's their son. <laughs> and, and I see them holding the hands of little black girls. Yeah, I saw a lot of the demonstrations so, as well. So, that, well, that's, that's, no, it's, so it's different now, Shmuley, because of the fact that people yeah. are coming together, whites and blacks are coming together and saying, we don't understand this racism that you're talking about. We are going to get together, regardless of the fact that, that you want us to stay apart. We are not separatists, we are not segregationists. We are going, we are, we are, we are going to join the march. Black lives matter. Say it. That's what they're saying. Well, Peter, you were, you were the first to make this a vital and central social issue. You are a great champion of the African-American community. You have my deepest respect as such. You have been a courageous and powerful moral voice for decades and decades. And I, am, I can bear witness more than most to the constant courage you have shown. And you've been absolutely consistent. And you know what? Sadly, tragically, uh, you've been vindicated. Uh, I wish you weren't. <laughs> I wish these terrible moral outrages never happened. I, I wish and I hope and I know that America will become a place, God willing, where whites and blacks look beyond any kind of difference to see in each other an equal child of God as brothers and sisters and and I'm not saying that we should be colorblind because there are unique things about black heritage or Jewish heritage. There are unique things about et ethnic ethnicity and ethnic history that can, that can yeah. be enriching to a society. Yeah. No, 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 I, I, I swear you, this is one of the reasons why you and I, but this is one of the reasons why I love you as, as, as a brother. This is one of the reasons why you and I have been able to get along and respect each other. When, you know, I, when, when I remember that, that, that meeting with us in, 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 uh, in Israel and um, in, in Palestine, we're going to meet Yasser Arafat. You know I mean? Uh, Jews hate Yasser Arafat. But I'm trying to tell you because I know, I know your mind. I know you can actually sit down and talk to him and bring him together. And you argue for hours before we can go up. And that, that's what I respect you for who you are in terms of how you, 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 you defend your points, you defend your issues regarding your people. And, and how I defend mine. When I brought you, when I brought you onto uh, into the WRL, people say, hey, why are you arguing with him? Who is this guy? I wanted to show people then that we can have this discussion. And you continue, you, pa you pass the test big time. People loved you. So that's great. That's important. <laughs> that continue to love I wish, me. I wish yeah. the Jews liked me as much as the well, attack. Remember when they attacked me? It was me only the Jews who had an issue with me, Peter. They attacked me and you. So that's, so that's, that's comforting, you know, at least, you know?
Anytime. Peter, uh, I have deep love for you. Um, I am so sorry about the loss of your mother. I wish that you and I were not joined in mourning and grief for, for parents. You know, when you called me and told me about your mother, I remember I had a pit in my stomach. Uh, and, and also because nothing was open at the time, I couldn't even um, grieve with you in person. Uh, and I never expected that uh, just three weeks yeah. later that I would be uh, in the same position. And, and it leaves a hole in one's heart that is so difficult to fill. And, um, but I wish you God's comfort. And I want you to know, Peter, that you have fought God's battles. We've had our disagreements and we might do things a little bit differently, but I want you to know that you've been a voice for all humanity recognizing the image of God imprinted on all of God's children. You have been one of those leading voices. It's, it's actually been a very spiritual voice and I recognize it as such. And, I, and I'm grateful to you and you have my deep love and deep respect. And we have to get together for another Shabbat dinner <laughs> so we can have this great debates, kill each other all over again in front of the I, guests. Julian, I want you to go to bed tonight, you know, safely and not thinking about, do not worry about me. You will not see me on the front page of the New York Times or the New York Post or the Daily News advocating violence against police officers. You won't see that. So you can go to bed, rest your mind, do not worry. And Peter, just tell us about the book you're working on. Are you, are you talking about it yet or not? Oh, the, 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 book, the book has done is, I, for three years, I was at Columbia University doing a piece on police criminalizing and killing black men and boys in the 80s and the 90s. And it's a whole, it's like, there's a whole pattern and practice of behavior by police officers. What we're seeing here today, we have seen before. So and I, when I presented this to Columbia University, they said, yes, we want to know that. So I, I, kept, I kept polishing it and polishing it. I'm not as successful as you, writing 40 books, your big time New York Times. But, but, but talk, about, talk about relevance. Wow, what a, unfortunately, what a relevant book. And it's done now, right? Sorry, it's done, and then it's, it's being considered. But you're, not, but you're not yet revealing the title, is that correct? I'm not revealing the title uh, for a simple thing, right? Yeah, different reasons why. Peter, thank you for joining us. Thank you for, st for being with me so late. And I can't wait for us to get together and comfort each other after the loss of a parent and hug each other and uh, break bread together, our two families who, who so deeply love each other, and my kids who love you, and Louise, and all, and, and Colleen, and, and uh, God willing, you'll join us for Shabbat dinner. And God bless you, Peter, and God keep you safe. Peace. Peace. God bless you, Peter.